Welcome to this video. This is the first of all the pre-AP videos and thus it's termed Introduction to Chemistry. And it's meant to be if you've missed the first day of class so that you don't miss anything else. Um, these videos are here so that in the event that you are sick, dying, need to leave because you've got some other more important thing to do besides chemistry. I don't know what that would be because chemistry is the most important class you're taking, I'm sure. But I have made this just for you. So, introduction to chemistry. Let's talk about chemistry. First off, everything you interact with, from the seat you're sitting on, to the computer you're watching, to the planet you will live on, is made of chemicals. And a chemical is any substance that is the same no matter where it comes from. Uh, water is water. Whether you get it here or you get it in Thailand, it's still water. Now when a chemical changes its composition, that's called a chemical change. And there are five signs of a chemical change. Uh, production of an odor or gas. Believe it or not, there are chemical changes that are occurring inside your body at all times. When you digest food, it causes that food to undergo a chemical change. And that produces an odor or gas. Production of light is a sign of a chemical change. So fire, the reason that you see fire or candles produce light is because they are undergoing a chemical change. Anytime something loses or changes color, now I'm not talking about, oh, I put Kool-Aid in water and that changes the color. No, that's caused by a dye. A change in color or loss of color would be like metal that rusts. For example, Statue of Liberty, when she was first made, was a brilliant uh, copper statue. And over time, she has rusted to the, to the green color she has now. That's because she went from being copper to copper oxide. Her chemical composition has changed. Change in temperature. Now, we're not talking about you heat something up and now it goes from being cold to warm. Nay, nay. We're talking about things that, on their own, change temperature. So, for example, an ice pack. If you're a lifeguard, you know the most important thing you carry around with you is an ice pack. And what an ice pack is, it's a bag inside of a bigger bag. And in the little bag, there's a liquid. And in the big bag, there's a whole bunch of what feels like sand. When you pop the little bag in the center, the liquid mixes with the sand, and the ice pack gets cold, really cold. Lastly, if a solid falls out of solution, this is called a precipitate. And we'll actually be doing a lab in some, uh, at some point between uh, lead iodide and, sorry, lead nitrate and potassium iodide. And this will produce lead iodide, which is a very shiny yellow substance that's going to fall out of those two solutions. If what I just said made you cry a little, don't worry. It'll get easier, but a precipitate, just for your information, for the vocabulary aspect of it, is when a solid falls out of solution. Now, chemicals come in three varieties or three flavors. We call these their phases, and they're a representation of how attracted the atoms are in that substance for one another. If they are extremely attracted to one another, they're a solid. And we symbolize solids. You know you are dealing with a solid when you have a chemical formula that ends in a parenthesis S. That parenthesis S, if it's a subscript, means that it is a solid. And this means that the atoms in that substance or in that compound are extremely attracted to one another. And they're going to stay very close together. So close together, in fact, that they have no movement beyond vibrations. They'll vibrate but they actually won't move. They are extremely attracted to one another. And because they're extremely attracted, any attempt to move them away from one another is going to be met with a lot of resistance. And so because of that, they have a definite shape. And because they have a definite shape, they take up a very fixed amount of space. So they have a definite shape and volume. So these, uh, these atoms are very close together. This picture is blurry intentionally because it shows that they vibrate against one another, but they are not moving. They have no freedom of movement around one another.
If you break some of the attractions, if you weaken some of the attractions between those atoms, you'll end up with a liquid. And liquids are symbolized by a lowercase s at the end of the formula, uh, usually in cursive and again in brackets or in parentheses. Again, the atoms are still very strongly attracted to one another, but they're now free to move a little bit. And because they can move a little bit, you can push on them and they'll meet you with a little resistance, but not a lot. And therefore, they have no definite shape. They still take up a certain amount of space, so they have a volume, they have a definite volume. For example, if I have a gallon of water, I have a gallon of water. That's a definite volume. But if I pour that gallon of water out over a table, it's not going to have a shape. It's not like it keeps the shape of the gallon jug. So the atoms are free to flow and move around one another, but they're still going to stay together as much as possible. Lastly, if you overcome all the attraction, if, you, uh, or if an atom has no attraction for, its ma for the other atoms, this forms a gas. And we symbolize gases with a lowercase g in parentheses at the end of a formula. Because gases have no attractive forces, they're easily pushed against one another. They fly around freely. And there's a lot of empty space between them. Because of this, they have no definite shape and no definite volume. If I fill a room with a little bit of gas, that gas will spread out and across the whole room. And it's not as though it maintains any particular shape. Because there's a lot of empty space between each atom, because they have no attraction for one another, they are easily compressed. I can push on a gas, and it doesn't push back to a certain point. So here, gases, easily free-flowing, constantly moving around, lots of space between them. So when matter undergoes a chemical change, there are signs of it. But what if there's a physical change? A physical change occurs when the substance doesn't actually change. Nothing is used up. I can undergo a physical change and not have anything different after I'm done. For example, if I take a piece of paper and I burn it, that's a chemical change. I start with paper, I end with ash. If I take a piece of paper and I cut it in half, cut it into little pieces, that's a physical change. It's still paper. I still have paper. I just have little pieces of it instead of uh, a whole sheet. It doesn't affect the chemical, it doesn't affect the physical properties of the substance. But what is a physical property? A physical property is any property of a substance that can be measured without changing it. And they can come in either intensive or extensive. An intensive physical property is independent of how much of that substance I have. So for example, density is independent of how much I have. Water has a density of one gram per mole, if I, or one gram per milliliter, sorry. If I have one gallon of water, or if I have a whole ocean, it's still one gram per milliliter is its density. Same with boiling point uh, or melting point. Those are intensive physical properties, because whether I have one gram of water or I have a ton of water, it will still boil at 100 degrees Celsius. An extensive physical property depends upon how much you have. So things like size, uh, mass, shape, uh, volume, those are extensive. They depend on how much I have. The way you can keep this straight is intensive is independent. Intensive is independent of how much you have. Extensive depends on if you have an extensive amount or you have a little bit. Okay? Uh, just for sake of on the worksheet, temperature is an intensive property. Whether I have a milliliter uh, or whether I have one gram of metal that's 100 degrees or I have 
a ton of metal that's 100 degrees, they both are 100 degrees. Temperature would be an intensive property. So let's go back to chemical changes again. Chemical changes are any change that results in the substance being consumed and making something new. So anytime a substance is, undergoes a chemical change, you're having what's called a chemical reaction, or you're observing a chemical reaction. And the chemical or the compound that's being used up is called your reactants. The chemical that's being produced, the new thing that is made, are your products, because you're producing them. And we try to balance out chemical reactions with coefficients. And these are big numbers in front that show how many atoms are needed. So for example, if you have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and you light a spark, there's a little bit of an explosion, a little bit, and you form water. Well, hydrogen and oxygen are used up to produce water. So hydrogen and oxygen are our reactants, and they produce the product water. And we want the equation, we want everything to be balanced. So what you see in the middle, the arrow, is kind of like an equal sign. We've got to have the same thing on both sides. So over here I have two hydrogen molecules, each of which contains two hydrogens. That's what the little numbers mean. That's how many hydrogens are in that molecule. So I have four hydrogen atoms in total. On this side, I would need to have four hydrogen atoms. And if you look, I have two water molecules. Each one has two hydrogen atoms. So I have four hydrogen atoms on this side. And if this is balanced, I have two oxygens on in the two oxygens in in, in, in. I have two oxygens in a water molecule in an oxygen molecule. I have one in a water molecule, so I would need twice as many waters to balance that out. If what I just said lost and dazed and confused you, you are not responsible for balancing any equations yet. We will go over it in much greater detail later. Just this is to get your feet wet so that you don't uh, break out in hives when I use the word coefficient uh, later. The coefficient is just a number that we're using to balance the equation on both sides. And that's your introduction to chemistry.